Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is flow rate and actuator speed. Our objective is to learn how flow rate and volume influence actuation time and speed for linear actuators like hydraulic cylinders. Additionally, we'll examine the relationship of displacement, rotational speed, and flow rate for pumps and rotational actuators like hydraulic motors. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers has watched the circular area and cylindrical volume lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only demo recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. A word of warning to the viewer, the scope of this lecture is limited to hydraulic systems, i.e. fluid power systems that use incompressible liquids like oil to transfer power. The incompressible nature of liquids means a given volume of liquid remains that exact same volume regardless of pressure conditions. For example, one gallon of oil at 10 psi still occupies exactly one gallon of volume at 100 psi or 1,000 PSI, or even 10,000 PSI. Now, this is not true, especially at extremely high pressures. However, for the purposes of this lecture series, we are going to assume it is. The incompressible nature of liquids makes flow rate and actuator speed calculations extremely easy. Pneumatic systems, i.e. fluid power systems that use compressible gases like air to transfer power, in contrast, aren't nearly as easy to calculate these same properties since a given quantity of air occupies different volumes at different pressure and temperature conditions. For example, a standard cubic foot of air occupies a cube 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches or 1,728 cubic inches at 68 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level atmospheric conditions, but only 864 cubic inches, being a cube roughly 9.5 inches by 9.5 inches by 9.5 inches at twice atmospheric pressure at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. To further complicate matters, compressible gases like air are additionally subject to temperature-induced changes in volume and pressure. We'll examine the behavior of ideal gases and pneumatic systems in much later lectures. Again, this lecture is limited to scope to hydraulic systems, i.e. fluid power systems that use incompressible liquids like oil to transfer power. Let us begin. First, let's refresh our understanding of unit conversion, circular area, and cylindrical volume. One gallon is equivalent to 231 cubic inches. Don't ask me why, I don't know. If we wanted to convert a given quantity of gallons, let's say 4.5 gallons to cubic inches, one would multiply 4.5 gallons times 231 cubic inches over one gallon such that the unit we don't want, gallons, cancels out, and the unit we do want, cubic inches, remains. This calculation demonstrates 4.5 gallons is roughly equivalent to 1,039.5 cubic inches. This additionally serves as a reminder that U.S. customary units like gallons and cubic inches do not use engineering prefixes, and this quantity cannot be expressed as 1.0395 kilocubic inches and must be expressed in its awkward entirety. We can also do this conversion in reverse. If we wanted to convert a given quantity of cubic inches, let's say 115.5 cubic inches to gallons, one would multiply 115.5 cubic inches times one gallon over 231 cubic inches such that the unit we don't want cubic inches cancels out and the unit we do want gallons remains. This calculation demonstrates 115.5 cubic inches is equal to 0.5 gallons. This additionally serves as a reminder that U.S. customary units like gallons and cubic inches do not use engineering prefixes and this quantity cannot be expressed as 500 milligallons and must be expressed in its awkward entirety. The viewer should additionally be able to calculate the cap and rod end area and volume of a double acting hydraulic cylinder. Consider a double acting hydraulic cylinder with the following dimensions. Diameter of cap, 4.5 inches. Diameter of the rod, 1.25 inches. And a travel length of 18 inches. An application of the circular area formula demonstrates the fully circular cap end has an area of roughly 15.9 square inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula demonstrates the fully cylindrical cap end has a volume of roughly 286.3 cubic inches at full extension. Another application of the circular area formula demonstrates the smaller rod has an area of roughly 1.2 square inches. The area of the ring-like rod end is the area of the cap minus the area of the rod. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the ring-like rod end area has an area of roughly 14.7 square inches. The volume of the tube-like rod end is the area of the ring-like rod end times the height. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the tube-like rod end has a volume of roughly 264.2 cubic inches at full retraction. You will note 
the tubular rod end has less volume than the fully cylindrical cap end because the solid rod, when fully retracted, occupies that space. This will have consequences when it comes to calculating actuator speed, as we'll soon demonstrate. All right, hopefully these techniques were a review. If not, please check out the aforementioned lecture and bring yourself up to speed. Let's now move on to the topic of today's lecture, flow rate. Flow rate is a measure of how fast or slow a volume is occupied. Flow rate is customarily measured in units of gallons per minute, abbreviated as GPM, or if you're in a country with a working government and a functional healthcare system, liters per minute, abbreviated as LPM. Both of these are measurements of units of volume per unit time. I say again, flow rate in units of GPM is a unit of volume, the gallon, per unit of time, the minute. This directly specifies how to calculate flow rate. Flow rate, Q, don't ask me why it's Q, I don't know, is measured in gallons per minute, is volume in units of gallons divided by time in units of minutes. Q equals V over T. An extremely convenient way of graphically expressing this three variable relationship is using a three variable pyramid with volume at the apex and flow rate Q and time T side by side forming the base. To solve for Q, take volume V and divide it by time T because flow rate is volume over time. To solve for volume V, take flow rate Q and multiply it by time T because they're side by side. Finally, to solve for time T, take volume V and divide it by flow rate Q because volume is over flow rate. As simple as this three variable relationship may seem, it is not without its complications, principally because a user often has to deal with unwieldy and archaic unit conversions commonplace in the fluid power industry. Consider our previous area in volume calculations involving a double acting hydraulic cylinder, notably a cylinder having the following dimensions. Cap diameter of 4.5 inches, a rod diameter of 1.25 inches, and a travel length of 18 inches. Using our previously acquired knowledge of circular and cylindrical volume, we demonstrated the fully circular cap has an area of 15.9 square inches, and at full extension, the volume of the fully cylindrical cap end is 286.3 cubic inches. Let's deal strictly with the act of extension first. Extension necessitates oil enter the cap end port and fill the fully cylindrical cap end. Only when 286.3 cubic inches is filled the space will this cylinder fully extend the 18-inch rod. The act of extension also implies the rod end is simultaneously evacuated. Let's say the cylinder is subjected to a flow rate of 2.2 gallons per minute. And again, we're being asked to solve for the extension time. Simple, right? You got a known volume and a known flow rate. Time is just volume over flow rate. Away we go. Hold on, not exactly. Pay attention to the units. As simple as this setup is, a known volume in cubic inches and a known flow rate in gallons per minute our volume units don't match. Additionally, is a minute really the best choice of time? For this application, probably not. Think about it. If a gallon is 231 cubic inches and the fully cylindrical cap end has a volume of 286.3 cubic inches, it's a little bit more than a gallon. If you got a flow rate of 2.2 gallons per minute or around two gallons per minute, most likely this space is gonna take less than a minute to fill. It's for this reason I highly recommend a user first convert flow rates in gallons per minute to a more usable format, notably cubic inches per second. This necessitates a chain of conversion. First, change gallons per minute to cubic inches per minute, then cubic inches per minute to cubic inches per second. To do so, one multiplies 2.2 gallons per minute times 231 cubic inches over one gallon, such that the unit we don't want, gallons cancels out, and the unit we do want, cubic inches, remains. This first stage of the unit conversion demonstrates 2.2 gallons per minute is equivalent to 508.2 cubic inches per minute. Next, we convert cubic inches per minute to cubic inches per second. To do so, one multiplies 508.2 cubic inches per minute times one minute over 60 seconds, such that the unit we don't want, minutes, cancels out, and the unit we do want, seconds, remains. This final stage of the unit conversion demonstrates 2.2 gallons per minute is equivalent to 508.2 cubic inches per minute, which is also equivalent to 8.47 cubic inches per second. By the way, you may see flow rate in units of cubic inches per minute expressed using the abbreviation CIM, 
as in cubic C, inches I per minute M. And flow rate in cubic inches per second, expressed using the abbreviation CIS, as in cubic C, inches I per second S. Having completed this necessary first step, we are now set up for a quick and easy flow, volume, and time calculation. Time is volume over flow rate. Substituting our calculated values for the volume of the cap end units of cubic inches and flow rate in units of cubic inches per second demonstrates this cylinder should reach full extension in roughly 33.8 seconds. Before we move on to the act of retraction, think about the extension speed of this cylinder. Again, be careful with the units. Speed is a measurement of length per unit time. What speed units do you want? Inches per second, feet per minute, miles per hour? Point being, you may have to perform an additional unit conversion depending upon the desired units. If you want extension speed of units of inches per second, we are already set up for success. Speed is length per time. The rod moved 18 inches in 33.8 seconds, achieving a speed of roughly 0.532 inches per second. Slow indeed, but still faster than your lazy lab partner. If, however, we're asked to determine the speed in some other unit, let's say feet per minute, one again necessitates a chain of conversion. First, change inches per second to inches per minute, then inches per minute to feet per minute. To do so, one multiplies 0.532 inches per second times 60 seconds over one minute, such that the unit we don't want seconds cancels out, and the unit we do want minutes remains. First stage of the unit conversion demonstrates that 0.532 inches per second is roughly equivalent to 32 inches per minute. Next, we need to convert inches per minute to feet per minute. To do so, one multiplies 32 inches per minute times one foot over 12 inches, such that the unit we don't want, inches, cancels out, and the unit we do want, feet, remains. This final stage of the unit conversion demonstrates the cylinder extends at roughly 2.7 feet per minute. If you think about it, flow rate, volume, and time calculations are super easy. After all, it's just three variables. Any difficulty you may encounter with these types of calculations simply may be because of unit conversions. My advice is this, stay neat, stay organized, a task which may be beyond your lab partner's capacity. Above all, do your results make sense? In this case, they certainly do. We're presented with a volume of a little bit more than a gallon and a flow rate of a little bit more than two gallons per minute. Is it surprising it takes around half a minute to fill? No, no it is not. Given it took roughly half a minute to extend, a foot and a half, is it surprising the rod is moving around three feet per minute? Again, no, no it's not. The point being, have a rough idea of the results before you do the calculation. In later lectures, we'll examine pumps, flow control valves, and different flow control methods that can vary the flow rate into or out of an actuator and thus vary its actuation speed. For now, consider this simple thought experiment. What happens if I increase flow rate? Too easy. Actuation time is V over T. If Q rate is increased, actuation time should decrease. It makes sense. More units of volume are being stuffed into a constant volume at a faster rate, thus the time it takes to fill it decreases. Less actuation time means the actuator moves faster. Conversely, what happens if I decrease flow rate? Again, too easy. Actuation time is V over Q. If Q is decreased, actuation time should increase. Again, it makes sense. Less units of volume are being stuffed into a constant volume at a slower rate, thus the time it takes to fill increases. More actuation time means the actuator moves slower. Lastly, consider the influence of volume on actuation speed. Given a constant flow rate, larger volumes take more time to fill, whereas at a constant flow rate, smaller volumes take less time to fill. It all makes sense. Case in point, consider the act of retraction for this same double acting cylinder. The act of retraction necessitates the smaller tube-like volume of the rod end be filled while simultaneously the volume of the cap end is exhausted at low pressure. During the act of retraction, a solid steel rod is pulled into the rod end, which occupies space, thus displacing oil entering the rod end. Long story short, the tubular rod end volume necessitates less oil volume be filled than the fully cylindrical cap end. Again, consider a constant 2.2 gallons per minute of flow entering the rod end and answer this simple multiple choice question. No 
calculations required. The time to fully retract this cylinder will be blank as the time to fully extend the cylinder. A, less than, B, more than, C, the same as, D, none of the above, E, all of the above, and F, yes.